All right, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be presenting on Bill C-28, uh, which is a bill that reforms the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Um, I'm Peter Hilson, and joining me today is Kanisha Asharia Patel. Uh, and we're going to be talking, yeah, about Bill C-28, giving an idea of what exactly is covered by that bill, and as a result, kind of what, uh, what SEPA itself is. Um, and then providing a little bit of analysis about, um, you know, what are some good parts about that bill, what are parts that don't do as much as we'd like to see, and then providing some recommendations for, you know, what might a strengthened bill C-28 look like. So jumping into that, it'll be useful to start off with, you know, what exactly is the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, or SEPA, as I'm going to call it uh, throughout this presentation. So SEPA is one of Canada's primary pieces of environmental legislation. Uh, it was enacted in 1999 uh, and it empowers environmental protection in a variety of ways. So if we look at some of the parts that are included in SEPA, um, part two engages with public participation, part three looks at information gathering, part four pollution prevention, part five controlling toxic substances, part six animate products of biotechnology, part seven on controlling pollution and managing waste, and finally part eight dealing with environmental matters related to emergencies. Uh, and what we're mostly going to be talking about today is part five. We'll deal kind of with a couple more general things, but part five it has mostly been the focus of the work that Kanisha and I have been doing in terms of looking at SEPA reform. So digging into that, part five is the part that deals with controlling toxic substances. Um, and I've heard this referred to before as the heart of SEPA. Um, and in general, what part five does is it provides for the designation and regulation of SEPA toxic substances. And I'll get a little bit into exactly how a substance is designated as toxic under SEPA. Um, but just for now, we'll kind of, yes, see that part five deals with those types of substances. Um, the enactment of SEPA in 1999 required the minister to compile a domestic substances list. Um, and this is a list of all substances that were present in Canadian commerce at the time of the enactment of the bill. Um, and then it requires the minister to categorize those substances as toxic or not toxic on the basis of whether they are yeah, toxic or capable of becoming toxic. Again, we'll talk about exactly what that means in a second. Um, if through that assessment of substance is found to be toxic, it is then added to schedule one, the list of toxic substances under the bill, and it can be regulated from that point. Um, and on the right there, we've got the first little part of the list of toxic substances or schedule one. So as I was saying, um, SEPA part five in particular revolves around this designation of, of toxic. Um, and this is laid out in section 64 of SEPA. And so a substance is toxic if, quote, it is entering or may enter the environment in a quantity or concentration or under conditions that have or may have an immediate or long-term harmful effect on the environment or its biological diversity, constitute or may constitute a danger to the environment on which life depends, or constitute or may constitute a danger in Canada to human life or health. So those are the, the factors that are considered when determining whether a substance is toxic for the purposes of SEPA. Um, there are a number of other uh, provisions in SEPA that deal with you know, the gathering of that information, exactly how that information is kind of brought together for a toxic or a determination of whether a substance is toxic or not. We're not gonna dive too deep into those today. I think Kanisha will probably deal a little bit more closely with that uh, in her portion of the presentation. Um, but for our purposes, it's good to know that, you know, that's the definition that's laid out in SEPA. Um, because SEPA uh, uses a risk-based approach, so it looks at, you know, what's the risk of a substance causing these, these damages. Um, part of determining whether a toxic or substance is toxic is a risk, ass risk assessment process. So you look at if there's any risk posed by the way that a substance uh, is being emitted or being used in uh, the environment. And then if a substance is found toxic and added to schedule one, then you move into what's called a risk management process. So 
from that point, the government looks at the risk that it had identified and then tries to manage the risk. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why a risk-based approach potentially has some limitations to it, um, but that's kind of how SEPA works as it, as it currently exists. Um, and again, we'll touch on this as we move a little bit further, but under section 65, there's a kind of related but slightly different process why, by which a substance may be designated for virtual elimination. Um, and this is meant to differ from regulation and that the end goal of virtual elimination is, you know, uh, theoretically eliminating the existence of the substance. We'll see that the way that's functioned hasn't really accorded with that, but the difference for now between virtual elimination and, and regulation under schedule one is this difference between limiting risk to a certain amount and just getting rid of the substance in general. So before we get into talking specifically about what bill C-28 does, it's good to know, you know, how has the government been thinking about reviewing and reforming SEPA in recent years? So SEPA provides for a review of the act every five years, uh, starting in 1999. So there was a review in 2005, um, but then there was no committee established in 2010 or 2015. Um, and finally in 2016, the government started what you know, it was calling a review process. Um, so after 11 years, the government released a discussion paper that looked at some potential issues and challenges in SEPA. And then in 2017, the Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development um, submitted a report on SEPA, which includes recommendations for reform. And that was partially based on public consultation, uh, including some consultation from SELA. Um, and then in 2018, you know, as the kind of end of that whole review process, the government released a follow-up report looking at the recommendations that had come from the Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development and providing you know, government feedback on those uh, recommended reforms. And Bill C-28 was introduced in April 13, 2021 as kind of the culmination of this whole process. So um, that's 16 years after the last review. So you know, there's kind of big hopes riding on this bill in terms of, you know, providing adequate reform that's been uh, identified through all those other various processes. So now we wanna look at how does Bill C-28 stack up to what we had hoped it might cover. Um, so some priorities identified by the environmental community in the consultation that went into the 2017 review include recognition of a right to a healthy environment, uh, greater protection of vulnerable populations, better implementation of safe substitution for toxic substances, um, establishment of national air quality standards, and better regulation of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, so there, there were many things brought up in that review, but these are kind of several thematic areas that, that are a, a special concern and that you know, the environmental community was really hoping that government might integrate into its reforms to SEPA. Um, so how does Bill C-28 address those priorities? In general, um, and I think Kanisha will get more into specifics of this, but Bill C-28 gestures towards safe substitution, vulnerable populations, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and cumulative effects, but does not significantly change management or create new mandatory duties in relation to these topics. Um, so I've created, um, in my work throughout the summer, uh, a chart and analysis that goes you know, line through line, uh, Bill C-28 and SEPA, looking at what those changes are. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe send that around uh, later um, to, to kind of the SELA students. Um, so you can take a look at those specific changes, but in general, yeah, they're more permissive. So giving the minister ability to look at these factors, but without really creating duties to consider them in any new or mandatory way. Um, Bill C-28 recognizes a right to a healthy environment, but in a limited or more limited way than we would have hoped it to. Um, it doesn't address national air quality standards, and there's some uncertain impacts on public participation in Bill C-28. Um, so on the whole, I would say, yeah, there's 
changes made in relation to some of the priority areas that were recognized, but perhaps not the degree of change that we would have hoped to see from a bill that has, you know, been in the works for so long. Something to focus on in particular, uh, looking forward both in terms of things that are of concern in Bill C-28 and also potential avenues to push for strengthening of that bill is in relation to Schedule 1, so that's the list of toxic substances, virtual elimination, and safe substitution. Um, so there's kind of a constellation around these three topics that I'm going to try to elaborate on now. Um, so Bill C-28 proposes to split Schedule 1 into two parts. So right now we just have a list of toxic substances. Any substance that's added to Schedule 1 goes on there and has gone through risk assessment and will be subject to risk management. Um, Bill C-28 proposes to split it into part one, which includes in general substances that have been designated for virtual elimination and part two includes all other substances. Um, there's very little substantive difference between these lists outside of that initial kind of dividing, other that when a minister adds a substance to schedule one under part one, um, they're required to prioritize prohibition methods. So something closer to virtual elimination, uh, though not exactly the same as what's required under that regime. And part two requires the minister to prioritize pollution prevention uh, measures. Um, and so you can see there's a little bit of a difference there, um, but there are some issues with bifurcating schedule one that we should be concerned about. Um, the reason for this bifurcation is unclear. Um, possibly it's to mollify industry concerns. So there's long been a concern coming out of industry that listing substances as toxic under SEPA creates um, a like quote unquote stigmatizing effect to those substances. So the idea, idea being that, you know, some of the substances on schedule one are things that people wouldn't like normally consider to be toxic. Um, and so industry has long been concerned about substances being called toxic and the impact that could potentially have on, you know, use of those substances. Um, the problem with this type of concern is that it ignores the fact that all substances on Schedule 1 have gone through risk assessment and been found to be, you know, to create enough risk to warrant placement on that schedule uh, and consideration of risk management. Um, another possible reason to split Schedule 1 is to replace the virtual elimination regime. So Bill C-28 does eliminate virtual elimination, somewhat ironically. Um, and so if we go back to the government's discussion paper in 2016, a bifurcation of Schedule 1 uh, was contemplated as a possible replacement for virtual elimination. Um, a little bit later, I'll talk a little bit more about you know, why virtual elimination is being replaced or what some potential reasons are there. But for now, just this bifurcation could potentially be gesturing towards that type of, type of goal. The big problem with bifurcating Schedule 1 uh, is that it potentially risks SEPA's constitutional underpin underpinnings without really improving that virtual elimination piece or, or without really addressing, you know, uh, without a pressing reason for doing it. Um, so if we think back to Hydro-Quebec, uh, and the criminal law power. Um, it's a common first year constitutional law case. I'm sure all the students remember it. Um, but what this case essentially does was it's often like it lays out the some of uh, the outer edges of the criminal law power, what exactly the criminal law power is. Um, so under the criminal law power, the federal government is permitted to regulate um, what is termed public evils. Um, and so in Hydro-Quebec, it was found that SEPA uh, is a legitimate exercise of the criminal law power because rather than claiming to regulate all substances in Canada, it claims to regulate a small group of, you know, especially dangerous substances that could be considered a public evil. Um, however, this bifurcation of schedule one 
potentially risks creating the impression that, you know, the one, the substances on part one are especially dangerous or like the real toxic substances and that the ones on part two are of lesser concern or not ones that are actually toxic. Um, and this is a problem because it, it gets a little bit hazy as to, you know, if we're saying that the ones on part one are particularly dangerous or really toxic, is it legitimate for the government to prohibit or regulate the substances on part two as part of the criminal law power? Um, so bifurcating this list and making it unclear as to, you know, the status of the substances on part two uh, potentially undermines some of SIPA's constitutional underpinnings. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this uh, belies the fact that, you know, all the substances on Schedule 1 have gone through evaluation and risk assessment to find that, you know, they are dangerous and do meet the toxic definition under SIPA. Um, so there's no reason to introduce this kind of, um, there's no compelling reason to introduce this uncertainty into whether these substances are like, quote unquote, really toxic or not. Um, if the goal is to fix virtual elimination, there are better ways to go about doing this that I'll elaborate on as we go, go forward. And if the goal is to mollify industry concerns, um, it's kind of, the potential benefits are greatly outweighed by the risks posed to SEPA's constitutional underpinnings. So I'll elaborate now a little bit on virtual elimination and safe substitution and how those uh, might be, what those are and how those might be accomplished, uh, how goals around those might be accomplished in a better way than through bifurcation of schedule one. So to look at exactly what virtual elimination is, CEPA provides that some substances may be designated for virtual elimination. Uh, under this regime, the minister must develop a plan to eliminate substances that are persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. However, virtual elimination has not been used very often. It's only been applied to two substances, uh, one of which is to the right on this slide. Um, and the 2016 discussion paper posits that this is because, you know, there's a number of reasons here, but one major one is a levels of quantification requirement that's included in the virtual elimination regime. What this requirement does uh, is it sets the virtual elimination regime out so that the goal is not actually to fully eliminate use of uses of substances, but to bring them below a level of quantification or the level at which they can be reliably measured. So this regime is somewhat complicated in the fact that, you know, the goal isn't actual virtual elimination, it's to get below this certain level. And this way of engaging in a virtual elimination is potentially problematic for diffuse sources in that uh, it can be, it is not possible to measure you know, at above levels of quantification, if you have numerous diffuse sources as opposed to point sources, where a level of quantification is perhaps a more relevant or effective measurement tool. Um, and so as a result of these kind of problems, Bill C-28 proposes to eliminate virtual elimination um, and replace it with this bifurcation of schedule one, uh, whereby, as I said, substances on part one, uh, the minister must prioritize prohibition when considering regulation, and they are required to prioritize pollution prevention when looking at substances on part two of schedule one. Um, this kind of intersects with an idea of safe substitution, um, whereby you would look at, you know, if a substance is toxic, is there another substance that is more safe that fulfills the same role that the toxic substance does and then you know can we replace the toxic substance with a safer substance um, bill c28 gestures towards safe substitution substitution recognizes its importance and allows the minister to consider it but doesn't require anything new or anything beyond that um, so when we're thinking about virtual elimination safe substitution and the bifurcation of schedule one um, my recommendations would be first, don't split schedule one. 
Um, it comes with too many risks without sufficient rewards. As we talked about, there's the, con the issue of constitutional underpinnings being, um, being unsettled without the sufficient and with the reward potentially just being making industry feel better or maybe introducing um, this replacement for virtual elimination that doesn't really accomplish what we would hope it would. In addition to that, we'd want to retain virtual elimination and remove reference to levels of quantification uh, so as to make it a more effective regime. Um, and in relation to that, the goal should be complete elimination or sunsetting of substances. So what this means is that, you know, as you might expect it to, virtual elimination should, when it when a substance is designated for virtual elimination, uh, entail the goal being complete elimination of that substance and sunsetting, which refers to a process by which you create a plan to get to an, a time when the substance is, is not present in Canadian commerce at all. Uh, and this language of sunsetting sunsetting is actually present in earlier reviews of SEPA. So it's something that the government has thought of before uh, and is probably, you know, what virtual elimination should like look like if we wanted to, wanted to improve it. Um, and then finally, this is a little bit of a more expansive recommendation, um, but additionally, it would uh, improve or strengthen this part of SEPA uh, if we were to implement robust safe substitution requirements. Um, so for example, SELA's proposed SEPA amendments would require the creation of a safe substitution assessment and a plan for every substance on schedule one. So outside of just substances designated for virtual elimination, SELA's recommendations require the minister to assess possibilities for safe substitution for every substance on schedule one, and then create a plan either to identify safe substitutes or to begin the process of phasing out or sunsetting uh, toxic substances and phasing in safe substitutions. Um, and again, that's, that's a more expansive step, um, but ultimately what we'd hope to see out of, um, out of a stronger SEPA that, that looks at um, embracing virtual elimination and safe substitution more completely. Um, and thinking about the relevance of these provisions for vulnerable populations, um, I think this quote from the UN Special Rapporteur on toxic substances um, or hazardous substances and wastes, their visit to Canada, um, they note that there exists a pattern in Canada whereby marginalized groups and Indigenous peoples in particular find themselves on the wrong side of a toxic divide subject to conditions that would not be acceptable in respect of other groups in Canada. A natural environment conducive to the highest attainable standard of health is not treated as a right, unfortunately. For many in Canada today, it is an elusive privilege. So what I take this to mean, uh, and what I think the, the Special Rapporteur is getting at, is that you know, increased regulation of toxic substances inevitably leads to benefits for the most vulnerable because of the way that regulation of toxic substances functions in Canada right now. So under our current regime, vulnerable populations bear a disproportionate brunt of the impact of toxic substances in Canada. Um, and this is partially, or you know, a lot of this can be attributed to the way that SEPA is designed and perpetuates insensitivity to this disproportionality. Um, Kanisha will elaborate on this in the context of GBA plus analysis, um, but on a kind of high level right now, um, we can see some of this insensitivity to the disproportionate burdens on vulnerable populations stemming from SEPA's generally risk-based approach. Um, so especially in the case of in instances like virtual elimination or safe substitution, um, where we're talking about management of risks, that's not enough to properly account for impacts on the most vulnerable, given the way that Canada currently approaches risk uh, and, and focusing on risks of toxic substances rather than viewing those substances as hazards to be eliminated. Um, however, virtual elimination and safe substitution are both areas that lean towards a more hazard-based based approach that better serves environmental justice. So, 
if we think about virtual elimination or safe substitution, these deal with finding a substance that is hazardous and working towards completely eliminating it or substituting it, which is not so much a risk-based approach as one that you know, works towards recognizing something as a hazard and then getting rid of it. And this better serves environmental justice, partially because it's, it's more in line with the precautionary principle, uh, but also recognizes that you know, the most vulnerable will face disproportionate impacts and unexpected impacts and, and impacts that aren't captured by just a purely risk-based approach that focuses on, you know, in general, what are the risks of a substance? Um, and so kind of with that in mind, uh, particularly thinking about the impacts of toxic uh, substances on vulnerable populations, I'll pass it over to Kanisha uh, to talk about GBA plus and how it intersects uh, with Bill C-28. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. So thanks, Peter. Um, so I'm going to be talking about gender-based analysis plus as a framework to improve Bill C-28, particularly as it pertains to protecting vulnerable populations. So what is GBA plus? GBA plus is an analytical process used to assess how diverse groups of women, men, and non-binary people may experience government initiatives, including legislation. So the plus in GBA plus acknowledges that gender-based analysis goes beyond biological and socio-cultural differences. It considers multiple other identity factors as well as the intersection of these identity factors. So here you can see a graphic that was released by the government of Canada that outlines the various identity factors that can intersect and com com compound any one person's vulnerability. So why does gender-based analysis plus matter in the SEBA context? GBA plus is essential for developing effective and equitable policies and legislation for diverse populations as it assists the government in identifying direct or indirect impacts of its initiatives on different Canadian populations, and then subsequently taking steps to mit mitigate the negative impacts. So in the SEPA context, any person's identity factors, either alone or in tandem, can cause them to be more vulnerable to the adverse impacts from toxic chemical exposures. As such, by approaching toxic substance management through an intersectional vulnerability lens, the government can ensure that it is protecting all Canadians, including the most vulnerable. So according to the Government of Canada's approach on GBA+, Without GBA+, plus, we risk missing or misreading the experiences of a significant portion of the Canadian population and as a consequence risk develop developing policies and initiatives that can inadvertently increase inequalities. So this is the reality of the situation under the current SEPA chemicals management approach and highlights the need for GBA+, plus to be comprehensively applied. So I'm going to first provide a background on GBA plus and the timeline and GBA's relationship with Canada. So it started in 1981 when Canada ratified the UN Convention of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Then in 1995, under this convention, Canada signed the Beijing Plat Declaration and Platform for Action in which the Canadian government committed to conducting GBA on all future legislation policies and programs. So SEPA 1999 came into force in 1999, which raises questions as to what the government's GBA approach was for this act as it follows that um, from the 1995 commitment that the government did conduct GBA for this new act. Um, but it definitely raises some questions as to the comprehensiveness of the analysis, especially given the lack of sex and gender considerations in the current chemicals management. Processes. So in 2000, the federal government adopted a five-year government-wide strategy to accelerate the implementation of gender-based analysis. Part of this was in 2004, establishing the Standing Committee on the Status of Women, or SWC, in the House of Commons, which is the agency that takes the leadership role in promoting GBA plus throughout the federal government. So in 2011, SWC expanded GBA to GBA plus to consider diverse and intersecting identity factors in the analysis. So this represented an expansion of 
GVA to move beyond sex and gender considerations and address some of the political, the issues surrounding political will of only wanting to use GVA on policies, legislations, or initiatives that seem to prima facie have impacts on women, whereas now it's considering all vulnerable vulnerability factors. So GBA plus now requires analyzing potential government initiatives through a gendered and vulnerability lens. In 2015, um, following the GBA publication of the Auditor General in 2015, which found that the government departments did not always conduct complete GBA analyses and the quality of analysis was inconsistent. So following this publication, um, in order to facilitate better quality and complete GBA plus, the application of GBA plus was made mandatory for all memoranda to cabinet and treasury board submissions. So memoranda to cabinet or MCs are essentially proposals for government bills that must be approved before the Department of Justice can start drafting the legislation. In 2018, SWC became a federal department named Women and Gender Equality in Canada. And in 2018, the Privy Council Office introduced a new MC template or a template for government departments to follow when drafting their MC submissions, which now requires a mandatory annex that presents the findings of GBA plus, as well as the due diligence and evidence-based analysis tool, which was to be used by governments to help implement GBA plus. And this tool also includes a GBA section and is mandatory as a part of MC development. So based on these requirements and the government's 1995 commitment to conduct GBA on all future legislation, including the new bill C-28, so it follows that the government conducted GBA plus in the development of bill C-28 and included their findings of GBA plus in their MC submission for bill C-28. So in order to assess the quality of this analysis, I wanted access to these documents. So I filed an access to information request on June 4th, asking for the new template for MCs, the due diligence and evidence-based analysis tool, just to see what the government's um, approach is for giving guidance to federal departments on GBA+. Um, also requested the explicit MC submission for Bill C-28 and the submission for SEPA 1999. Um, unfortunately, they got back to me and said that they had to consult with other government departments. So the legislative due date was extended to September 2nd, 2021. So hopefully when I do get access to these documents, it'll provide clarity on the application of GBA plus in the development of Bill C-28 in the early stages of the legislative process. However, even without these documents, the GBA plus framework still offers opportunity for the government to follow through on their new commitments to vulnerable populations in Bill C-28 by amending the proposed Bill C-28 amendments before it continues through the, uh, le the legislative cycle. SWC um, stresses that Gen GBA plus should be incorporated at all stages of the legislative cycle from the development of the act to the implementation of the act to the evaluation of the act. So this supports the application of GBA plus not only in the development of Bill C-28, but also in the implementation of the act, which would include in the assessment and management processes of toxic substances. Okay, so now we're going to dive into how this framework and GBA plus can actually help better protect vulnerable populations. So in order to first, um, in order to answer this question, we first have to look at how the current chemicals management approach is failing vulnerable populations. Then we can look at how Bill C-28 amendments do recognize the limitations and the problems that are associated with the current processes and recognizes the importance of considering vulnerable populations in chemicals management, but the amendments lack concrete measures to operationalize these commitments to vulnerable populations. And this is where GBA, can, GBA plus can step in. 
Incorporating GBA plus considerations into Bill C-28 amendments will help the government operationalize their commitments to protecting vulnerable populations by imposing mandatory responsibilities on decision makers to use GBA plus to identify and address adverse impacts on vulnerable populations, and by explicitly incorporating GBA plus into the risk assessment and risk management processes. Okay, so in order to better demonstrate how the current chemicals management processes do not adequately consider um, vulnerable populations, I have included a case study on a specific toxic substance, um, namely talc. So what is talc? Talc is a naturally occurring mineral and it's found in thousands of cosmetic and household products sold in Canada. You probably know it from Johnson & Johnson baby powder and it's in a lot of makeup as well as personal care products. So the final screening assessment found two critical health effects associated with talc. The first being inhalation, um, which can cause damage to the lungs. And the second is exposure to the female genital area or perineal exposure to products containing talc, such as body powder, genital antiperspirants, bath bombs, and bubble bath. And exposure of talc to the female genital area has had positive associations with ovarian cancer. So the government proposes to, the government's proposed human health objective is to add talc to the list of toxic substances and decrease inhalation and perennial exposures from certain talc containing self-care products to a level which is protective of human health, whichever, whatever um, that means. Um, so the government in its risk assessment did not ident explicitly identify these populations, but as you will see, vulnerable populations in relation to talc include women or people with ovaries, um, workers who work with talc, children and infants who probably have had baby powder being used on them, and essentially consumers as a whole who are vulnerable due to the lack of publicized information regarding talc hazards. Okay, so now we're gonna look at how the specific risk assessment process and the limitations. So the current risk assessment process does not meaningfully consider how various intersecting identity factors or social determinants of health can impact toxic chemical exposures. So for example, sex specific differences such as hormone regulation or body fat composition can render women more vulnerable. And this is compounded during critical windows of vulnerability such as infancy, puberty, pregnancy, lactation, and menopause. Women are also disproportionately impacted by multiple chemical sensitivities, which is related to multiple chronic low dose everyday exposures. And these types of exposures are not considered in the current risk assessment process. So in the context of talc, there are various vulnerability considerations. So sex differences, namely the presence of ovaries, makes women or people with ovaries more susceptible to the negative impacts associated with talc use. Gender speaks to the presence of exposure. For example, women are disproportionately exposed to toxic substances from personal care products as these products are marketed towards women. Using these products in critical windows of vulnerability could also increase susceptibility to negative impacts. Income and socioeconomic status can impact the quality and type of products bought and used because not everyone can afford high quality green products. Socioeconomic status can also increase vulnerability to exposure due to geography, perhaps by living close to industrial pollution or mining sites of talc or factories for talc. Occupation, so workers who work with talc are inherently more vulnerable to talc exposure. And lastly, identity factors such as education and language can impact a consumer's ability to take their own precautionary measures to avoid using these products. Um, the current process also fails to consider cumulative effects and low dose exposures. So the intersectionality of various identity factors speaks directly to the need to consider cumulative impacts. The current processes do not consider cumulative impacts, rather each chemical is assessed individually, which is not representative of the reality that a person is exposed to a multitude of chemicals from multiple routes 
such as inhalation, skin absorption, and ingestion, and multi from multiple sources, such as food, air, and water, from all of the places that they work, live, and play in. So for example, individuals who may already be in situations of vulnerability, such as new immigrants and, or those with low socioeconomic status, are more likely to take on precarious employment in hazardous environments such as aesthetics or housekeeping services, which are less regulated professions with less health and safety protections. And these people are also less likely to be purchasing and using organic green products at home. And these intersecting factors further entrench their vulnerability to toxic exposures. Further, low dose exposures can still have tremendous negative health impacts, including delayed effects, especially for those suffering from multiple chemical sensitivities who are disproportionately women. So in the context of talc, the risk assessment did not consider the reality of multiple co-exposures or possible negative impacts from low dose exposures, especially in critical windows of vulnerability. The risk assessment also did not consider the very real possibility of asbestos contamination. Talc and asbestos occur naturally close together in the earth. So asbestos is often found near talc and is a known carcinogen with well-documented health effects. The reality is that many cosmetic products have tested positive for asbestos, for example, compact powders, eyeshadows, and contour palettes, including children's makeup. As recently as November 2020, a U.S. study found that 14% of the talc-containing makeup tested also contained asbestos. So failing to consider this very real possibility of asbestos contamination undermines the strength of the risk assessment of talc. So the current approach also fails to implement comprehensive information gathering methods. So the assessment on talc did not employ the use of disaggregated data in a meaningful way. So the data was disaggregated based on very few factors such as age and body weight, but it was not disaggregated based on sex, gender, socioeconomic status, race, or any other important identity factors. Also, a lot of the studies that were used were animal studies, studies from outside of Canada, very outdated studies, and there was no indication of collaboration with Canadian health institutes or representatives of marginalized communities. The current approach also only considers available data. So the screening assessment identified, for example, that there was no current information regarding how cosmetic products can contribute to perennial exposure of talc and with what frequency and amount. So Although the risk assessment process identified this critical research gap that would be very important to understanding in order to better protect women from these risks, um, the assessment did not take any steps to fill this research gap. And this is largely problematic and contributes to the ongoing lack of research and studies that are being conducted pertaining to women's health specifically. So now we're gonna move into the risk, assess, the risk management process. So the risk management process currently fails to implement protective mitigation measures and effective public transparency. So the proposed risk management objectives on, for talc was to amend the existing entries under the cosmetic ingredients hot list and the natural health products ingredients database. A second proposed risk management objective was public communication to help avoid inhalation or perennial exposure. But for some reason, while this risk management objective was identified in the draft screening assessment in 2018, it was dropped in the final screening assessment. So the existing entries under the cosmetic ingredient hot list and the natural health products database are the same and they both state that talc is restricted for use in cosmetic products by requiring that products in powder form intended for children and infants include cautionary statements, keep out of reach of children and keep powder away from a child's face to avoid inhalation, which can cause breathing problems. Neither entry identifies other cosmetic products that should carry warnings and cautionary statements such as makeup, genital antiperspirants and epilatory products such as VEAT or NAIR. 
and the existing cautionary statements do not consider impacts on vulnerable populations outside of children and infants. And this is a form of environmental discrimination. So in order to better understand just how real this problem is, so I'm gonna paint a little picture. So there's a teenage girl who is in a critical window of vulnerability, specifically she's in puberty, um, going through puberty, and she is also disproportionately impacted by the beauty standards and marketing strategies that push so many cosmetic products on young women. So this girl would probably be able to walk into Shoppers Drug Mart and see Veet or Nair for sale with no hazard label pertaining to ovarian cancer. And this girl has probably not been surfing the Health Canada website for critical health effects of talc, so probably doesn't know the risks associated. So she can go ahead and buy this product from Shoppers and use it in the perennial region without even knowing that she is now at a very increased risk of ovarian cancer. The risk mitigation measures that were identified include reading the product labels and following safety warnings, avoiding inhaling loose talc powder, avoiding female genital exposure to talc, and choosing a talc-free alternative. All of these risk mitigation measures have a, a, same, a similar trait in that they all put the onus on the consumer which is largely problematic. And this is exacerbated by the fact that many talc containing products don't contain hazard labels regarding ovarian cancer or other risks. It's also exacerbated by the fact that there's a lack of transparency with the public regarding information on hazardous substances. So a consumer should not have to search up the toxicity of a substance or product. There should be public trust that the products available to consumers are safe to consume. Failure to communicate, um, there was also failure to communicate the non-critical health effects. So the screening assessment identified two main critical health effects, but there were also various other health effects that were identified, including lung fibrosis, asthma, reduced immune response, um, and migration and persistence of talc particles in the body. And none of these risks are included in the final screening assessment, nor in any public kind of resource resources available. So the current approach also does not meaningfully apply the substitution principle. So in the talc context, there are known safe alternatives to talc, such as arrowroot powder. So why is substitution not taking place? The screening assessment also asks stakeholders to submit information on alternatives. And this responsibility should not be on the stakeholders. It should be a mandatory responsibility for the government to undergo and develop safe substitutions and then implement these safe substitutions. The assessment also asks stakeholders to submit information on socioeconomic considerations in relation to the substance. So this would probably include how women or people with low socioeconomic status are more vulnerable. But this should not be the responsibility of the stakeholders. And these considerations should be addressed much earlier in the risk assessment process, not as a sort of checking the box in your final screening assessment. So finally, the risk assessment process does not currently meaningfully apply the precautionary principle. So all of these critical health effects were identified in the draft screening assessment in 2018. So why were no precautionary measures such as informed substitution or mandatory hazard labeling taken since then? So it's very probable that between 2018 and when the final risk assessment was released, there were many preventable exposures to talc. So now we're gonna move into how Bill C-28 does recognize some of these limitations. So Bill C-28 introduced various amendments pertaining to vulnerable populations and cumulative effects, including but not limited to the addition of a definition of vulnerable populations, new language in the preamble, which recognizes the importance of considering vulnerable populations and risk assessments and in minimizing the risks posed by cumulative effects, and recognition that the government's duty includes exercising its powers in a manner that protects the environment and human health, including the health of vulnerable populations. But um, it's important to note that recognizing the importance of considering and protecting vulnerable populations is not the same as mandating tangible, enforceable actions. 
So this moves us into how Bill C-28 currently lacks concrete measures to operationalize the government's new commitments to protecting vulnerable populations. So there are various limitations to the bill's D28 proposed amendments. They do not specify exactly how the government will implement their new commitments and do not create any mandatory duties. Rather, the language often indicates that the consideration of vulnerable populations is discretionary. So by keeping these condition, considerations discretionary, the government runs a very probable risk of failing to uphold its commitment to protect the health of vulnerable populations. But incorporating GBA plus considerations into the Bill C-28 amendments will help operationalize these commitments in a meaningful and forcible way. Integrating GBA plus considerations can result in a more equitable risk assessment and management process. So many of the shortcomings identified in the proposed amendments, for example, the minister may consider available information, the minister may consult, um, can be addressed through GBA+. Plus. So GBA+, plus requires four overarching steps, which would be gathering and reviewing data, consult, consultation with diverse stakeholders, examination of vulnerability considerations, and identification of risk mitigation measures to address any inequalities. Further, within all four stages, GBA+, plus recognizes the importance of public transparency, so providing accessible, understandable information, as well as consultation with stakeholders, including health institutes, civil society, and representatives of marginalized communities. So let's start with the definition of vulnerable populations. Under Bill C-28, vulnerable population is a group of individuals within the Canadian population who, due to greater susceptibility or greater exposure, may be at an increased risk of experiencing adverse health effects from exposure to substances. So in the context of GBA, we would recommend an expansion of the definition for clarity to define specific vulnerable subpopulations, including those who, by reason of no, one- I finished my part. One or more intersecting identity factors are subject to disproportionate potential for exposure to or from adverse effects from a substance. Um, so now let's dive into the ministerial responsibilities. Um, here we can see a pattern of inconsistency between the language in the preamble and the actual legislation. So Please bear with me, it's a lot of legal text, but um, I'll try to make it as understandable as possible. So the minister must consider available information regarding vulnerable populations and cumulative effects when conducting and interpreting the results of risk assessments under SEPA. So GBA recommendations would be the minister shall, not may, the minister shall actively seek out and generate information and conduct investigations and tests on vulnerable populations and cumulative effects. The minister shall also identify critical data gaps and take tangible actions to fill these gaps. <clears throat> According to Status and Women, Status of Women Canada, GBA plus is much more effective when it's supported by relevant research and disaggregated data, as I mentioned before, because disaggregated data can help identify inequities that more aggregated data may conceal. So the next amendment, the Minister of Health's obligation to conduct biomonitoring surveys as part of the obligation to conduct research and studies may include vulnerable populations. So we recommend the minister shall conduct biomonitoring surveys in relation to the health effects of a substance on vulnerable populations. And the minister shall disaggregate this data by GBA plus identity factors. So biomonitoring data disaggregation can allow for risk assessments to better characterize the distribution of risk within specific populations, which can then inform the identification of mitigation measures. 
So now we get into the information gathering provision, which is section 68A under the current SEPA. So for the purposes of assessing whether a substance is toxic or capable of becoming toxic, the minister may collect or generate data and conduct investigations respecting various factors. For clarity, I've only included the ones that are pertinent to vulnerable populations. So they include whether exposure to the substance in combination with other substances can cause cumulative effects, whether there is a vulnerable population in relation to that substance, the ability of the substance to cause delayed effects, or the ability of the substance to disrupt the reproductive or endocrine system. So GBA plus recommendations. We recommend that the minister shall conduct or generate data, including data disaggregated by identity factors and conduct investigations and tests respecting the factors listed under the information gathering provision. Oh, sorry. But also add a GBA factor under this provision and specifically the manner in which the intersection of sex and gender with other identity factors can impact exposure and or susceptibility to toxic to toxic harms. Further, for the purpose of conducting human health risk assessments, so uh, under the factor of whether there is a vulnerable population in relation to the substance, um, we would suggest requiring the use of a human receptor, which is a hypothetical person, with predefined physical and biological characteristics that are representative of a maximally exposed person. This is the approach taken for human health risk assessments in British Columbia. Basically, they create a hypothetical person or a human receptor who has all of the vulnerability factors and therefore is like the most vulnerable person to let's say exposure of a specific substance. And then that is the hypothetical person that you're trying to protect with the legislation. Because if you're protecting the maximally exposed person, you're also including people that are less exposed, but more importantly, you are protecting the maximally vulnerable person. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, so under that list, um, two more factors are the existence, development, and use of safer or more sustainable alternatives to the substance or product, and the manner in which the public may be provided with information regarding the substance, including by labeling it. So again, we would recommend that these two um, factors be required for analysis, not the minister may. It would be the minister shall seek out and develop and use safer or more sustainable alternatives in accordance with the substitution principle and also require the hazard labeling of all products with hazardous substances. This should not be up to the minister's discretion. When conducting and interpreting the results of risk assessments under SIPA, the ministers must employ the weight of evidence approach and the precautionary approach. So first of all, we would recommend that in addition to these two approaches, there be an explicit requirement that the minister shall employ the GBA plus approach. And we also recommend that these approaches all be defined within the act. So the weight of evidence approach is a method of assessment that involves systematic assembly of all data regarding hazard, exposure, and risk from multiple sources of information and lines of evidence. So the existing provisions and the fact that it's the minister may consider available data does not support the use of the weight of evidence approach. So only relying on available data basically means you're only relying on one or two lines of evidence rather than seeking out and generating multiple other lines of evidence to consider altogether. We also recommend to amend the definition of the precautionary principle as there are very, um, there are many variations of the definition in the environmental community. Um, and we recommend that the vulnerable populations will be better protected if the precautionary principle is meaningfully applied, um, which could be done it by amending the precautionary principle. So we would recommend removing the reference to cost effective measures um, or clarify that cost effective measures must be focused on the most cost efficient way to, to achieve the needed precaution. So the cost effectiveness 
part of the definition should not be used as a test for whether precaution should be exercised. Protection of health takes precedence over economic considerations, but the inclusion of the term cost effective in the definition may allow people to think that it, you are running through a cost benefit analysis of does it make sense to apply precautionary measures when in reality it's not a test for whether precaution should be exercised. We would also admit, um, suggest that the principle be invoked when there are reasonable grounds for concern rather than threats of serious and irreversible harm so that truly precautionary measures can be taken rather than waiting for possibly serious or reversible harm to occur. So moving on, in developing and implementing a plan that specifies the substances that are prioritized for risk assessment um, and may specify the activities or initiatives in relation to assessing, controlling, or managing the risks, the minister may consult with stakeholders. So GBA would require that the minister specify the activities or the initiatives for public transparency and also require that the activities include the generation and use of research and data disaggregated by identity factors and the creation of publicly available information regarding the substance or product, including specific ingredients and associated risks that does not require individual consumers to seek out this information. We would also require that the minister shall deliberately seek out participation and meaningful consultation with diverse stakeholders, including vulnerable populations. So an issue that we have not really touched on, but it is super important, is access to justice and remedies. Part of protecting vulnerable populations is providing them and other members of civil society with the means to hold decision makers accountable and seek redress for toxic harms. Um, further research is required as to how this issue can be addressed in Bill C-28. Um, but for example, it could be done by adding citizen suit provisions to the bill explicitly. So we hope that this presentation has provided you with an overview of SEPA and Bill C-28, um, limitations of the new bill and recommendations on how to improve it. Um, thanks for listening.